Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to the Sighted Moon audio newsletter for the week of February the 5th, 2021, and we're also going to look at the current week, February the 13th. This is the 50th newsletter of the year 5856, and it is it was the 23rd day of the 12th month. Um, so let's get into it. Okay, this is the audiobook, Zoom meeting, Torah portion, New, New Year 2021, and Holy Day dates. We at SightedMoon.com, let me just move this over the top there. We at SightedMoon.com will begin our New Year Saturday evening after the sun sets. Oh, okay, that's, uh, that would be tonight. Okay. Actually, the, I think the Chinese are keeping it either yesterday or today as well, because they keep a Lunar New Year. So maybe they're doing, I don't know if they're doing the sighted moon. I don't know. I had no idea they were doing, maybe they do or don't. I don't know, but it's lunar based anyhow. Sunday, February the 14th will be the first day of the new year. Even though Devorah does not agree with us, this year she has been very kind in providing a calendar with the various dates when the holy days will be. Uh, depending on what you believe. Yeah, I noticed that too, and that's really kind of her and considerate too. I do sincerely thank her and appreciate the act of love towards all the brethren. And to be honest, I'm not even I'm not even a hundred percent decided or convinced that it's going to be uh, this evening. I really don't know. That's why I have to prove it to myself, and hope everyone does this is to prove it to themselves, prove it for themselves. Look at all the facts and base it on the scriptures and, and the evidence that you can uh, see with your own eyes. And the everything will, shall be established by the uh, testimony of at least two witnesses, at least. Okay. I did sincerely thank her and appreciate the act of love towards all the brethren. Let not our differences be cause for division, but do let them spur you to investigate each one and determine for yourself what you and your family will do to be honest i mean if you're even if you do prove it i mean you should do it based on what you're able to prove but if it's still somewhat uh, unclear i think it's good to just do both you know uh, the one for uh this tonight and next month as well because if, i mean if it's really unclear it should be better just do both i mean it may not be practical for some but considering the lockdowns maybe it's more possible to do that now whereas people uh, without the lockdowns would get fired because you know they have to appear and show up you know in person but this way there's a lot more flexibility i i, I think after the Sabbath, February 13, those who want to join us on our weekly Sabbath service uh, will stay on and celebrate together the sighting of the new moon. Oh, that's awesome. That's the first time we're ever doing that. Uh, I've been hankering for one of these, uh, like a new moon kind of gathering. I don't think I've ever done that with other believers, I should say. Um, to have like a special meal, special fellowship, that, that's really good. Re rehearsing. Uh, what we're going to be doing in the future, because that's what it says. Everyone will be gathering and worshiping God, our Father, uh, on the Sabbath, the holy days, and the new moons. It does say that. That's prophetic. We have uh, we will have people from around the world, so the celebrations will be throughout the day and evening, depending on where you live. We hope you might want to join us. Uh, okay, moving on. It's a big blank space there. I don't know what that's about. This year, our new year is going to line up with the Chinese New Year. When I say, when I saw this, it got me spinning to see if I could find a common history. Why do the Chinese keep the beginning of the year at this time? You know, they usually do it in February, every February. They're not really March, usually February. So Chinese New Year, also known as the Lunar New Year or the Spring Festival, is the most important among the traditional Chinese festivals. The origin Oh, it is the most important. Okay. The origin of the Chinese New Year festival can be traced back to about 3,500 years ago. Uh, Chinese New Year evolved over a long period of time, and its customs have undergone a long development process. I actually have a video about 
uh, ancient China and, and, and the Torah and the Bible. And it's kind of shocking. A lot of their ancient beliefs kind of line up with <laughs> Genesis and the flood and a lot of uh, Torah principles. It's really shocking because uh, looking at the way they are now, in terms of, I mean, the present government and how they banned religion all across the board, or at least, you know, the good religions. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd say their government is kind of like a religion right now. <laughs> they worship the government, but uh, they want to be treated as gods. You listening to me? <laughs> and, and CCP, right? So anyway, uh, but looking at the ancient ways, man, when they had a bad ruler, they knew it was because of the morality of the people, but, you know, they realized when they had good weather and, and the crops were abundant and things like that, that that was because of a righteous ruler, that blessings would come due to morality, but curses would come when you would disobey and when do wickedly, when they would be wicked rulers and wicked people. So, I mean, mostly it's on the rulers more more of the responsibility, the accountability. So that's what I talk about in my video. Uh, I did that many months ago now, uh, last year. So like all tradition, traditional festivals in China, uh, Chinese New Year is steeped with stories and myths. One of the most popular is about the mythical beast Nian, who ate livestock, crops, and even people on the eve of a new year. It's interesting that Nian the yearly beast sounds the same as year in Chinese. Yeah, Nian. It's Nian. Nian is a uh, year in Mandarin. Uh, I just, I know that because I'm trying to learn Mandarin. <laughs> to prevent Nian from attacking people and causing destruction, people put food at their doors for Nian. Oh, well, that sounds like Passover. <laughs> Something with doors and avoiding destruction. It said that a wise old man figured out that Nian was scared of loud noises, firecrackers, and the color red. <gasps> Whoa, Passover right there. <laughs> blood, blood, right? Loud noise could be trumpets. So then people put red lanterns and red scrolls on their windows and doors to stop Nian from coming inside. Wow. Wow, when did this happen? Like, this is after ancient Egypt? This is interesting. Crackling bamboo later replaced by firecrackers, was lit to scare Nian away. The Shang Dynasty. Uh, New Year, I'm just going to call it New Year. <laughs> CNY has enjoyed a history of about 3,500 years. Its exact beginning is not recorded. Some people believe that CNY originated in the Shang Dynasty, 16 to 1046 BC, when people held sacrificial ceremonies in honor of gods and ancestors at the beginning or the end of each year. CNY established in the Zhao, Zhao Dynasty. The term Nian first appeared in the Zhao Dynasty, uh, 1046 to 256 BC. It had become a custom to offer sacrifices to ancestors or gods and to worship nature in order to bless harvests at the turn of the year. Actually, I'm going to just do this for newsletter. I'll do the next one later on. CNY date was fixed in the Han Dynasty. The date of the festival, the first day of the first month in the Chinese lunar calendar was fixed in the Han Dynasty from 202 BC to 202, uh, sorry, 220. Uh, does that make sense? How that, it shouldn't be 220 to 202, anyway. Certain celebration activities became popular, such as burning bamboo to make a loud cracking sound. And that's a short, oh, 202 BC to 220 AD. Okay, oh, I got confused there. So it's actually 400 year span. In the Wei and Jin dynasties, uh, 220 to 420, I think that's AD, uh, apart from worshiping gods and ancestors, people began to entertain themselves. Oh, they, they entertain themselves. Okay. How? The custom of a family getting together to clean their house, having a dinner, and staying up late on New Year's Eve originated among common people. I guess it originated in China. When I look in my Jubilee charts, I see that the Shang Dynasty fits the time when Yah told Moses to begin his year with the Aviv Barley. On uh, Exodus 12, 2. And the year that this took place was in the year 1379 BC. 
the Shan Dynasty would have started with 1600 BC, which was the time of the seven years of famine when Joseph was made second in command in Egypt. That was worldwide, remember. And the 1046 BC of the Shang Dynasty would have been the time when King Saul was made to rule over Israel. Ancient Asia Minor is a geographic region, region located in the southwestern part of Asia, comprising most of what is present-day Turkey. The earliest reference to the region comes from tablets of the Akkadian Dynasty, 2334 to 283. I'm, gonna, I'm not reading the years anymore. <laughs> where it is known as the land of the Hatti and was inhabited by the Hittites. The Hittites themselves referred to the land as Asua or earlier as Wiyah, as v, as Wiyah, which actually only designated the area around the delta of the river Kaster, but came to be applied to the entire region. Asua is considered the bronze, the bronze Age origin for the name Asia, as the Romans later designated the area. It was called by the Greeks Anatolia, literally place of the rising sun. Cool, I like Anatolia better. I'm going to call myself an Anatolian <laughs> for those lands to the east of Greece. So I'm an, I'm an Anatolian from now on. Connect, <laughs> connecting, what's the other name again? Asvia? Yeah, that's too hard to say. I prefer Anatolia. Thank you very much. Connecting the Chinese of Asia to those of Asia Minor is difficult to, is difficult to do. I'm not able to prove this at this time, but I do believe that the world at this time kept the calendar Noah taught them. As they migrated away from the Middle East, they had to develop ways to recognize when the year began. Yeah, good point. So I guess they'd use the moon, which what was which was what we were using since the very beginning. And the Chinese seem to have kept it to some degree, and also the majority of the Islamic nations too. Um, okay, the first day of CNY begins in the new moon that appears between January 21 and February 20 in 2021. The first day of the Chinese New Year will be on Friday, February 12, which is the year of the ox. So I guess they're they're doing it on the 12th of February because they're in China. So China's ahead by like a day uh, or 12 hours, I should say. So theirs actually started uh, because we're starting ours uh, on this evening. So they started theirs, uh, yeah, Friday, interesting. I guess they are a day behind or uh, ahead or something the day early cny is one of the most important holidays okay so it's influenced uh, new year celebrations such as the losar of tibet and china's neighboring cultures including the korean new year wow and the tet of vietnam it is also celebrated worldwide in regions and countries with significant overseas chinese or cinephone populations including Singapore, Indonesia, blah, 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 et cetera. Sorry, just et cetera. Don't mean to say blah, blah, blah. There's much more research to be done on this amazing new subject. Sivan 6, controversy explained. Oh, here we go. Get your popcorn. <laughs> this year, questions are already rising arising about which day is Passover and then which one will be Wave Sheaf Day. The answer is simple. If you take the time to understand this week, oh, understand this week, so I guess now, when you apply modern thinking, such as Passover being on the 14th or at the end of the 13th, then you get the confusion. Okay, we are not going to prove everything about Passover in this newsletter. We have all of these proof, all of those proofs in our archive section of our website. We are going to focus on one aspect for this week. Once you understand this, then you will know when Wave Sheaf Day is. This year, Passover happens at the very same time it did in the days of Joshua. So we have a biblical example to follow. I was going to say a clear example but even this one gets muddied and is the excuse judah 
uses to justify them keeping Shavuot on Sivan 6. And actually, maybe for the future, I'll just say Yehuda uh, in referring to, you know, because you can't say they're who they are anymore, I guess, because you get um, censored <laughs> and banned from the internet. So let's look at Passover week for us, celebrating the new year, February 13th, 2021. Okay, let's look at Passover, right? The week of Passover, right? Passover begins at sunset Saturday evening at the end of the 14th. Okay, yep. Wait, it does? The 14th. Oh, the 14th of the first month. Okay, not. I was thinking the 14th of February. So this year we will be keeping the Passover meal Saturday night as at the 15th begins after sunset. All oh, right, okay. The end of the 14th, okay. Joshua 5, verse 10. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the 14th day of the month in the evening. The same day they ate of the produce of the land, 11 cakes, parched grain. I'm just going to scan through it. Um, there was no longer manna for the people. They ate of the fruit of the land. Uh, that year it is the very one verse that Judah uses to justify them keeping Shavuot on Sivan 6. And this year of 2009, the exact same spring feast days are taking place. This year, the day of the Passover is taking place Friday evening and Saturday day. This is the 15th of the month of Aviv. It is the high holy day and the first day of unleavened bread. Most of you realize that the feast of unleavened bread moves from year to year. It can and does fall on any day of the week in other years. But this year it lands on the Sabbath exactly as it did when Joshua recorded this event in Joshua 5, verse 10. Okay, we are told, <clears throat> excuse me, we are told in Leviticus 23 that we cannot eat anything until we make this wave sheaf offering. Okay, yeah, it says that. And we are also told that they have to make this wave offering on the morrow after the Sabbath. Um, yeah, it does say that in the Masoretic, in the Septuagint, it actually says uh, the morrow. Uh, anyway, it is different in the, uh, the Septuagint. So one was Passover. Judah takes this information and then begins to count the Omer from the 16th of Nisan. Uh, I'm not going to say that word anymore, the 16th of the first month because there is no names for the knots. That's uh, Babylonian, so let's not say that anymore. Judah takes this information, begins to count the Omer from the 16th of the first. Oh, yeah. Actually, that's the way you're supposed to count it. It's actually the 16th, yeah. They always arrive at Sivan 6. I don't know if it's always supposed to be Sivan 6, uh, but it's supposed to be seven Shabbats. You count 50 days, yeah. They say Leviticus 23, 11 is the more after the high Sabbath. That's what the Septuagint says as well. Those of you who keep Passover in the 14th should be scratching your heads now. If not, go back and reread. I mean, I'm not going to give anyone, uh, what's that? I'm not going to give them a hard time. <laughs> Whatever you believe, you believe it. Just prove prove it. And if Yah lets you understand it, you do what he gives you to understand. So if he makes you understand that it's that way, that it's the Sabbath, not the holy day, then so be it. But uh, you know what? Let's just be very honest. Um, let's just look at it. Let's look at it right now. That's important. Like prove all things, right? Like it's not just say it and not and 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 uh, you know not do it. So let's let's prove it right now. Leviticus twenty three, uh, verse eleven. That's where it is anyway. Uh, I don't want to just sit here and, and pretend like I don't know when in fact we can look at we can look it up. But I mean, you know, it's up to you and your relationship with Elohim, with Yah, to decide, okay, how am I gonna just how am I going to determine uh, Shavuot? Because we're already uh, very much sifted like wheat. Uh, we're sifted and divided into smaller and smaller, smaller factions 
those who keep the feast days, that's a smaller faction. Those who keep based on the new moon, you know, visible new moon, that's also a smaller percentage. And then those who keep it based on the Aviv and, you know, different uh, quantities of, of the barley, that's even a smaller portion. And those who keep it uh, based on what it says here, right there, he shall lift up the sheaf before Yah to be accepted for you on the morrow of the first day. What is the first day? The first day is the the day after the first day of unleavened bread. That's the Hebraic understanding. So, and this ties in with with what Yeshua said that he will rise again on the third day. What does the third day means? It means three days. Uh, three days after the uh, the first day of uh, unleavened bread, because you cannot have Jesus Christ rising up after three days and three nights, and it's still being the third day. Think about that. It would actually technically be the fourth day. So is Jesus Christ lying? No, he said the third day. So he meant, and that was widely understood in that time by uh, the majority of the people observing the feast, Israelites and, and whatnot, that the third day and the first day mean uh, the first day of the count to Shavuot, which is you count 50. It says right here. Uh, where is that? Count 50. Um, it says you will count 50. Number to yourselves seven full weeks, right? Yeah, seven weeks. Rather, seven Sabbaths. So it means it's pretty much the same thing. But it says here, until the morrow after the last week, you shall number 50 days. So until the day after, uh, the last week you shall number 50 days uh, and shall number, sorry, and bring a new meat offering. So we, had, we do have to count 50 days. And that, and again, depending on whether you think the Masoretic text is what Jesus Christ used, which came again 400 years to 1,000 years after he died. <laughs> and remember who's, who are the people translating it, uh, people who were denying he even was who he said he was and denying that he was resurrected and censoring him out from prophecy? Or do you believe this text, which was the actual one that Jesus Christ had when he was alive, that Yeshua had and his disciples used and the early New Testament believers used? This is based on what Moses had written. It was only translated in Greek. The original original was destroyed when the temple was burned down. We have no, uh, this is the only remaining uh, this, this is how it exists today in the Greek language, unfortunately. But, you know, that's the way Yah made it. He made it to be this way. Not that you cannot reverse translate it back into Hebrew. You could if you really, if someone really wanted to, they could translate this back into Hebrew. If they really wanted to. But I don't have the know-how to do that. That would take someone of greater expertise in linguistics. So... He shall lift up the sheaf before you. Yeah, again, on the morrow of the first day. What is the first day? The morrow of the first day. Okay, so the first day of unleavened bread. The day after that, that's when it will be done. Not the day after the Sabbath. It's not always Sunday, but it's because of our our Roman Catholicism and, you know, Christianity that's rooted in Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. We think of Sunday just being the special day, but it really it's not has nothing to do with Sunday. It has everything to do with the first day of the feast. So anyway, that's my uh, <laughs> little thing there. I just wanted to prove it because you're supposed to prove all things. So either you believe it or you don't. But anyway, whatever you decide, uh, you do it based on how your conscience and the spirit convicts you. So when was the Passover? And I did a presentation this uh, last year on, called it an emergency something urgent. Uh, the third day, it's about the third day, and there's a picture of Pikachu saying, it says, Jesus Christ says he will rise in the third day. He rises in the third day, disciples. <laughs> yeah, because like, how could that happen if it was supposed to be after three days and three nights? It doesn't make any sense. It wouldn't be the third day, it would be the fourth day. But he's talking about the third day that was understood, widely understood to mean the third day of the count, three days after 
the first day of, of unleavened bread. That's what it means. Okay. Anyway, back to the newsletter. It says here, when was Passover? Okay. I'm kind of lost here. Uh, let's see, Von 6. Okay. Judah takes this information, begins to count the Omer from 16th of, of the first month. Okay. From the morrow up to the Sabbath, I read that already. Okay. Uh, so again, it really depends on what version of the scriptures you're reading. And, you know, that's my, that's my personal mission in life is to do this, uh, search the scriptures and to prove what are the significant differences that are going to be uh, very important for believers. So, I mean, it's up to you. Everyone has a choice to make, whether they accept the truth of God or not. Um, you are to count seven Sabbaths on the morrow. After the seventh Sabbath, you are to keep for Shavuot. So, and says Sivan 6 can end up on any day of the week in many years. Yeah, it's actually true. It can. If you're counting uh, 50 days from whatever day the first day of unleavened bread is, uh, the day after that, could be any day of the week. So, I mean, yeah, that's kind of... Reminds me of how Elohim works, even with the, so in a way, you can't really predict when that would be. I mean, you could, but I, I'd say Yom Teruah is way more unpredictable because it is on a new moon. So that one, that really is the day and hour no man can know. Although this one, Sivan 6 or Shavuot, you, you can know when it's going to be because you count 50. So automatically, you know, it's the 50th. Uh, every once in a while, it lands on the right time as it does this year. We have the Yehudim, <laughs> keeping Passover on the right day, the 15th. And the Bible in Yeshua 5 shows us it was the 15th because the morrow after is the wave sheaf day. And this is the day they no longer had manna to eat, but they ate from the produce from uh, of the land. But when they make this error and begin to count the Omer from the 16th and every year, okay, well... Again, personally, I believe they actually have it right. That's one of the few things they got right. <laughs> Add to this the fact that over time, they changed the fall holy days and postponed them. Yeah, I agree. That, that is wrong to do. There's no, there's nothing in the Torah that says postpone the holy days. Nothing. This is the Hebrew calendar that many of you follow, the Hillel too. If this is okay to keep, then it's also okay to keep Sunday or Friday as the weekly Sabbath. Yeah. I mean, some people keep Friday. I uh, won't say who they are, but, you know, the children of Ishmael. <laughs> if it is wrong to change the Sabbath to other days, then it is just as wrong to change the holy days to other days by counting wrong or by postponement rules or man-made takanot and ma'asim of the Pharisees. Yeah, those are wrong. But if it's in the Bible and you can prove it, then it's not wrong. Like, I mean, that it's in the Bible and, and Yah says it. But if someone says it, if someone says in the Bible, but it's not Yah, then it probably isn't right. It's their own opinion. Um, I mean, if it's not Yah inspired. The Takanot and Masim are the laws that have been added to the Torah by the sages. So these are these are of the Pharisees. And the Masoretic text is of the Pharisees. <laughs> it is. Do your research. And because of these rules, they have fallen away from keeping Shavuot and the fall feast at the proper time. Okay. So, yeah, it's important to realize that. Uh, I don't want to say it sarcastically, but it's, just, it's the truth. The Pharisees were the ones who developed, those who branched out from the Pharisees, the Masoretes, developed the Masoretic text. And as we know, they were enemies of Christ. They're enemies of Yeshua. They did not follow him. The majority of them did not follow him. Only the ones the ones who did, did, did so in secret. And they are probably, you know, just far and few, like, uh, what's his name? Nicodemus. And maybe some of them ended up becoming Essenes. I don't know. But the fact is, the followers of Yeshua, of the Mashiach, were using the Septuagint. That was their scriptures. So um, that's that. Okay, it is because of modern Takanot and Mahasim. 
we have the current trouble with determining when the barley has to be aviv and uh, by, and now many brethren will keep the holy days for this whole year one month later. Does it matter? After all, they have their heart in the right place. Yeah, I mean, they're accountable for what they do. And I'm sure if they knew the truth, they would probably change. But it, again, it takes takes work, takes effort to prove these things. And you can't just be lazy and go, okay, I accept it and not look it up for yourself and prove it. Again, I ask this question that I've asked many times now. Why did Yah allow um, 6 million Yehudim to be slaughtered in the Holocaust of WW2? Oh, I shouldn't even say the H word, actually. In the hollow. It's a guy called the hollow. The hollow. <laughs> I'm saying it because they were not keeping the holy days. Ooh, I don't know. I don't know if that's true anymore. If that's the reason why they were... I mean, it's because those people did it. They decided to do it. I mean, we can't blame God for everything. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they were punished for that in some ways, but I don't know if that's really the prime reason. It's speculation anyway, so I can't say it's right or wrong. Why do people think Paul was talking about the laws of God? Okay. Um, yeah, it was a Takanot and Masim, so it's Mark 7, 8. It was a Takanot and Masim <clears throat> that were, are added to the Torah, that was done to protect the Torah, but in fact causes the brethren to be led away from the truth. Um, so there's more verses there. Now something else for you to consider. You are to keep the days of unleavened bread for seven days. Okay, yeah, agreed. When we go back to Exodus, we are told, some more details. We're told to kill the lamb in the 14th, toward the end of the 14th. Yep, agreed with that. You eat the lamb at the end of the 14th. And the start of the 15th, the 15th is the memorial day. Yep. Uh, notice that the death angel passed over the homes of the Israelites and struck down the firstborn of the Egyptians on the 15th. The evening after they had killed the lambs, and placed its blood on the on their doors. Then as they ate the meal, the Egyptians died. This was on the 15th. Okay, the, the Egyptians died. Yeah, wow. Then the next morning, while it was still dark, they left. Again, this was on the 15th. You are to, you are to eat the Passover meal with unleavened bread. Note this commandment. You are to eat unleavened bread with the Passover meal. And you're also commanded to eat unleavened bread for seven days, not eight. Yeah, good point, not eight. You're not told to eat unleavened bread for eight days. Those of you keeping Passover at the start of the 14th, and then the seven days of unleavened bread need to pay attention to the commandment. Now, going back to Joshua 5, we can now, we can know or should now be able to understand that they ate the Passover meal on the 15th after the sun had set on the 14th, when it was the weekly Sabbath. Once the sun set, the, for, the first day of the week began. It was on this first day of the week, which was the 15th, that they ate the Passover meal. You are to eat the Passover meal with, with unleavened bread, and you are to only eat unleavened bread during these seven days, from the 15th to the 21st. So Yahushua kept the Passover meal, Saturday evening, they made the wave sheaf offering the next morning at 9 a.m. Yeah, that's the 16th, so the day after uh, the first day of unleavened bread. And then they could go and eat the produce of the land. I just think it's a coincidental that uh, it was uh, on Saturday, the 15th, and then uh, the Sunday was the 16th. It was just a coincidence. It doesn't mean it always falls on the Sunday. It it just shows you that what the Septuagint is saying is right. And it's the morrow after the first day of unleavened bread. And again, lining up with what Jesus Christ said, with what Yeshua HaMashiach said, that I will rise again on the third day. And just be intellectually honest. It can't be the third day if he said... After three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, I will rise up. 
because it wouldn't be the third day anymore, it'd be the fourth day. So we really have to get that right. And there's also the the road to Emmaus. We have the account where they're walking to Emmaus and uh, Yeshua was disguised and spoke with them and was asking them, oh, what's going on? And he said, what do you mean what's going on? Don't you know that this is what happened? And and even, and and even they even said the timeline, they mentioned that, and this is the third day since that has happened. So how can that be? <laughs> what are they talking about? This is the third day. So they have two witnesses there. You have two witnesses. It's not just what Yeshua said. It's also what these men said, walking to on the road to Emmaus. And there are other witnesses as well. So anyway, that's all to say there. Uh, comments. Let's read these really quick. All right. Uh, my calendar says Saturday is the 13th. Is Passover and Saturday evening or 14th February? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think because uh, they're a little... Uh, it wasn't clear to me either. Cause that's why I said, oh, he, he meant the 14th of the first month, not February. You have stated the wave sheaf day must fall in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Could you give verses that say that? I mean, it does. It just automatically does since the wave sheaf is the first day. Uh, it's tomorrow after the first day of Unleavened Bread. So it's kind of, it's impossible for it to not be during Unleavened Bread if it's the day after the first day. Um, again, are using the Masoretic text or the Septuagint? That's that's uh, can be the big differentiator there. I think some of the confusion when reading, yeah, that's what I said too. I guess a lot of people got confused, not just me. <laughs> all right, um, all right. What is this? Why not follow truth rather than error? Okay, so they're trying to say. That uh, yeah, they're trying to say that it. Why why did uh, they keep it on a Monday at one point? Worldwide Church of God. So anyway, who is this? Cosmos. Okay. Oh, Cosmos. <laughs> I'm thankful for my pseudonym, Cosmos1947, since I apparently fleetingly have your ear, permit me an addendum. For Messianic readers in 2021, I, correcting my witness, a 1968 scenario would be trivial, irrelevant, and distracting. Okay, what is he even talking about here? In hindsight, the explanation of the one day's delay is inadequate. My clarified deep memories. The Israelites under Moses did start counting the seven eleven bread days from the original Passover event, not as I stated from the sixteenth. That's when they started their walking exit. Um, Monday Pentecost was HWA's non-rabbinical eccentric misinterpretations. The day after, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come. And his temporary intimidated evangelist. Yeah, I mean, you know, they did what they did, but I mean, if they really looked at the scriptures, they would prove through the scriptures, not just using something out of scripture. Shalom, Joseph. Uh, yeah, okay. A lot of people got confused with that. It was really a stumbling block. <laughs> Man. Thank you for your input. Okay. From the beginning of time. Okay, the more academic and inquiring mindset, the more lofty disdain flows. Yeah, I mean, that can happen when people are, not all the time, but when people become fluent in Hebrew and Greek and they know the meaning of everything and so they get a little bit puffed up. I do admit that that is a risk to happen, but, you know, that's, that means they need to change your attitude. Not that knowledge is bad, but... You need to uh, have a mindset that, you know, you could be wrong to be open-minded and to consider all different uh, viewpoints and use their critical thinking and prove it, prove all things. 
because uh, in the end of the day, we're just men and God is God. Elohim is Elohim and, and we should know our place and he's the authority. So anything we know, it's only because he lets us know it, not because we're all, not because of anything we do um, or anything we've done, I should say. Yeah, we do put in work, we do research, but ultimately it's his mercy and his grace. Okay, miners of the truth, yeah. This guy's an interesting character. <laughs> I believe mercy comes from the merciful. Okay, we're getting really philosophical now. I mean, this person is definitely searching for things, and he's obviously reading the newsletter, so he's not completely... I wouldn't say he's just antagonistic for no reason. I mean, he's just trying to prove all things, it sounds like, but... I don't really know him too well, to be honest. I can't really say. But at least he seems to be reading. If I remember right, the Chinese call Elohim Shangdi. That is before religion was declared illegal. Hmm. I've waited a long time for you to state something of value. Ooh. Ouch. And <laughs> not the conspiratorial waste you have said in the past. Oh, this is... He, Sorry, this is what JD said. One sign of many that editor-in-chief editor is a converted soul and that unflattering to editor's blog still published deserves my congratulations. There are numerous religious pundits whose compelling newsletters and articles are put online, but their editors are keen to D.I. solo doctrinally. It's a lot of verbiage. Okay. Cited moon blogs from the informed readership seem less subject to that academically dubious cancel culture in contrast with overprotective pundits. Okay, can you get to the point, please? <laughs> this encouraging blindness to scriptural imperatives, it deserves a guarded congrats that is despite my recent perspicacious politically Etc. Blogs apparently judged substandard, for I personally suspect these two were just embarrassingly cutting too close. I mean, at least he published your comments. A lot of people don't even publish that. They would just delete your comment, but whatever. Respect is, respect is due where it's due, so I mean, he did publish your comments, so even though, even though he may not disagree with them, this month shall be to the beginning of the month. Uh, yeah, right. However, however, it was laid upon the original calendar that began the first day of creation. What was he talking about? Rosh Hashanah is not the first day of the month. Many people don't know we actually have two calendars. No, one calendar. There's no two calendars. <laughs> there are no two calendars in the Bible. There's this, the beginning of months is the first month of the first day. Rosh Hashanah is not... I don't, I don't even know what he's talking about. So anyway, that's the end of this newsletter. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Y'all bless you. Shabbat Shalom. And we'll do the next one in a little bit. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, just end this recording. Thank you very much.